but this is not a praiseworthy state to be sought. This is something that overwhelms them, that happens to them because of their love for Allah, and they fall out of the principle of being responsible for their actions. But one doesn't look to be unresponsible for their actions. The praiseworthy state is righteousness, holiness, sobriety, dignity, all these type of things that they define. The same thing with Al-Qushayri. When you look at Al-Qushayri's books on Asas, his same documents, you don't find any, anything in there about dancing, holding hands and doing what looks like the Hora dance. You don't find whirling dervishes. You don't find any of those things in those books. And by the time you read Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Rahimahullah's time, you find him saying, there are some who say, and some who hold, that dancing and music per, musical instruments are permissible for use. Kill them. Their blood is halal. It is nothing. They are unbelievers. That is his position. So it is later that we find people jumping and dancing like ants in a circus. It comes later, but it doesn't belong to the early generations. So Al-Junaid al-Baghdadi is coming from that old era. Further to this, further to this, you find that in 343 AH, there was another war between Saif ud-Dawla and the Byzantines, in which a huge army of Turks was amassed by Saif ud-Dawla, leading to his victory. Deaths in this year include Khaytham ibn Suleyman al-Atrabusi, Abu al-Hassan al-Samuri, and Abu al-Hassan al-Shaybani. I want to mention again for the, for the record, we discussed before the different types of mujtahids. In the early generations, up until Ahmed's time, that was the era of what you call mujtahidun al-mutlaqun. These are absolute mujtahids. They've memorized the Qur'an, all of the ahadith, which are one million in number. This was their era in which people did absolute ijtihad in every mas'ala. The last of the absolute mujtahids, as mentioned by Imam Dawood ibn Suleyman al-Khalidi, rahimahullah, he said the last of the absolute mujtahids to have dust poured over his head in his grave was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah. That ended the era of absolute mujtahids. After that, you entered into the era of mujtahidun al-murajjihun, which are mujtahids... Uh, excuse me, mujtahidun al-mutlaqun fil madhab. These are absolute mujtahids that are within a school. So as I mentioned, you'll find sometimes Abu Yusuf or Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahumullah differing with Imam Abu Hanifa on masail in wudu or masail in other things. But their usul, the 21 usul of the Hanafi school that they use to derive fatwa are the same. So you'll find, say, Abu Qasim al-Khiraqi and Abu Bakr Abdul Aziz, both absolute mujtahids within the Hanbali school, but they have difference of opinion among themselves in 98 masail. 98 masail. Why? Because they're absolute mujtahids within the school. So they can't get rid of the logarithm that Imam Ahmed explained and, and, and simplified, but they have a generous hand within the school. And so when you look in their books, when they speak about uh, Imam Ahmed, they'll often out of love refer to him as Ahmed because they're allowed to be on a first name basis with him because they're within his school, but they're absolute mujtahids. But the latter day scholars, you find all these titles before Ahmed's name and all these titles before Ulama's name because they're further away from the source. So this era, we start to get to the end of the absolute mujtahids within the school and we enter into the era of what are called mujtahidun al-murajjihun. The mujtahidun al murajjihun are those mujtahids who go through all of the books of the school and can tell you what is the preferred opinion. They can tell you what because there may be many opinions on a subject and someone is not able to derive what is the mu'atamid, what is the dependent upon position in the Hanafi school regarding raising the finger into shahud, placing the hands in salah. What is the fundamental bottom line position judicially within the school. Those scholars of that era began to collate books to simplify for the general public, ourselves, how we should understand the Mujtahidun al-Murajihun. In 344 AH, we have some of the scholars that died further. Abu Ya'qub al-Adra'i, Abu al-Fadl al-Qushayri al-Masri, Abu Amr al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr ibn al-Haddad, who was head over the Shafi'i scholars in Egypt. We have Muhammad ibn Zakariya ibn Hussein al-Nasifi and Yahya ibn Muhammad al-Anbari. 
345 AH brings us into the, into the queue with the Byzantines invading and conquering Tarsus, which is in today's Turkey, and killing more than 1,800 people, raping women, destroying cities and towns in the area. A huge war developed between Rozaban, who was a Byzantine ally on one side, and Mu'izz al-Dawla, who was the son of Saif al-Dawla and the Khalifa of the time, al-Muti'a. Rauza Bahan was defeated and his forces were completely decimated. Now in this year, some of the people that died among the ulama were Abu Ali ibn Abi Huraira, who was the head of the Shafi'is in his time, Abu Amr al-Samarqandi, Abu al-Hasan al-Qazwini, and Abu Bakr al-Bazzar. In 346 Hijri, rain was withheld and the sea level dropped some 80 cubits. One cubit is 19 inches. One cubit is 19 inches. So 80 cubits by 19 leaves you with the total of what you would use for today's measurements. So it dropped some 80 cubits, leaving mountains and previously submerged islands exposed for all to see. Now, some scholars state that new islands were found and make reference to Atlantis. But well, Allah knows best about how true that is because I didn't get an opportunity to go into depth regarding that but some historians give credence to the point that there was and is an island that comes into the fore reappears from time to time of some advanced civilization called Atlantis I don't know how true that is because like I said I haven't gone through all of the details in depth now some of the ulama who died in this year were Abu Muhammad al-Asfariyani, Ibrahim ibn Uthman al-Qayrawani, Abu Uthman Sa'id ibn Makhluq, who was the Muhaddith of Andalus, Abu Ja'far Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Hamza al-Samarqandi, and Abu Musarra al-Tamimi, who was the great Maliki scholar of Andalus. Now you can see in this time that Andalus is now producing its own ulama. What they made it a point to do is to not have to depend on Baghdad, who at this time was still being associated, although the Mu'tazila were defeated, they were still associated with oppression and backwardness and wickedness. Although you had scholars going from Andalus and visiting Imam Ahmed or other scholars in Baghdad, they would do that. But they would not mention the Khulafa of Baghdad in their khutbas which was known that in general you would pray for the ruler of your time in your khutbah and you would mention them but they would not mention them they would only mention the khulafa of andalus and they made no mention of baghdad their maps were just a big swath of andalusia and there was almost no mention that there was a whole massive abbasid khilafa that had its own army its own seafaring forces no mention of them whatsoever just like maps today that have a big swath of Israel and there's no Palestine. Same, same method. If, if we act like it's not there, it doesn't exist. And that's how, that's how Andalus was in many ways. Now in 347 AH, the Byzantine troops came into Sham and caused massive damage, destroying cities in large numbers. This caused Saif Dola to march out with his troops as he was the emir of Sham. It should be remembered that the Byzantines were Orthodox Christians. They were Orthodox Christians. And during this time, this was after the Great Schism. There was a major schism within Christendom around 1000 AD. There was a major schism. And the schism had to do with the authority within the church and also to do with the filial cli. The Eastern churches, if anyone ever gets the opportunity just to look at it or to look at through the window, the altar or inside of the church, you can see in Greek Orthodox, Coptic, Ethiopic Orthodox, Indian Orthodox, these other churches, Nestorian, that the Eastern churches use massive amounts of incense. There is a uh, whole different understanding of iconography in Eastern churches. Whereas the Western churches, because there were no Protestants at this point, you were Catholic if you were in the Western church, 
the Western Catholics had iconography, but their rituals were different. So within Catholicism, you have seven methebs. Seven methebs. One is the Roman rite. And we often say, when we think of Catholics, we think of Roman Catholics, but they're only one rite of seven. You have the Roman rite, the Byzantine rite, the Chaldean rite, the Coptic rite, the Armenian rite, and others. And there began to be a split between these methebs because they weren't methebs in fiqh. They were methebs in creed. And there were major differences between them in creed. So much so that the Eastern Church is still to this day, Russian and Greek Orthodox, believe that the Pope in Rome is one of the forerunners of the Antichrist because the split was that pronounced. Now, the Byzantine Christians were still in Constantinople because Constantinople had not been conquered and it was a major capital at that time. And so the fact that they were able to keep sweeping down and attacking Sham in these areas tells you how strong their military was. Even in the time of decline, the Byzantines were still very strong. Now, in 348 AH, a great battle occurred between Muslim Orthodoxy and the Shia in Iraq. The Shia sought help from the Byzantines to repel the Orthodox Muslims in a battle that had seen death on both sides. So Muslim and Muslims in Iraq were in incredible tribulations because the Orthodox Muslims were faced with the Shia cult on an everyday occurrence because some of the Abbasid rulers started to have Shia leanings and take on Shia doctrine in certain things. They'd already, some of them had already taken on the position that the Quran is created. And the Shia creed is Mu'tazila in its essence. So them taking on the Mu'tazila creed and then adding to it other bits and pieces of the Shia was not a problem for them. And so it became an issue because people who belonged to Muslim Orthodoxy, who were the majority, were now having to deal with a Shia quarter of the city. And they began to build their own places. And they began to build their own, or you would have a, you would have a meshhed, which in English should be a shrine, to a particular imam, like Ali ibn Abi Talib, and they began to block it off and divide it, where you would have visiting hours, the ziyara time, for the Shia would be during this time, and for the Sunnis it would be for this time. Because the two couldn't mix, otherwise there'd be, there'd be fighting between them. Now, the deaths in this year included Abu Bakr al-Najjad, Abu Muhammad al-Khuldi, who was head of the Sufis in Baghdad, and he was a student of al-Junaid. Abu Bakr al-Najjad was one of the scholars who took from the, the students of the students of Imam Ahmed. And his main point that he was famous for was that the only days that he did not fast on were Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. The rest of the year he did the fast of Dawood. Throughout the entire year. And he used to walk barefoot in the street. He'd have his sandals in his hand and he'd walk barefoot. And he was known for his knowledge of Ihsan, known for his knowledge of fiqh and creed, but he was, he was always aloof from the rulers and they would want to visit him. And he would refuse to allow them to visit him. And every day he would go and visit someone's house or some, one of the poor people and uh, distribute zakah among them. He was a wealthy man, but he would distribute zakah, try to assist the poor, the needy, the destitute, people that were naked. He tried to give them clothes. Things like this he assisted people in. So Abu Bakr al-Najad was very famous. In 349 AH, 200,000 Turks from various tribes became Muslim. The violence between Muslim Orthodoxy and the Shia in Baghdad calmed somewhat, but the Twelvers grew their power base day by day. They sought help from Shia members of the Banu Hashim and started to build their own places and were about to begin war again until Mu'izz, Mu'izz al-Dawla calmed the matter. Now, 200,000 Turks, this is with all the corruption and the oppression and the things going on during the Abbasids. 200,000 in that year. 200,000. The people today that are seen as, oh, these people are amazing in Dawah. They're so awesome. They're so good. They're so clean. They're so slick. They're so sharp. They never got 2,000 in one sitting. You've got 200,000 from some of the oppressors of our Ummah. 200,000. 
And that's making you understand that really 